Welcome to the Fredericktown Seventh-day Adventist Church. We have quite a treat today. I have, I didn't know Walt did speaking seminars. Um, so how many here know Walt <laughs> or know of Walt? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So quite a few people. Um, I worked with him at Heartland College for, I was there six months. You were there a good bit longer than that. But um He'll, he'll tell you some more about himself. A uh, few things that I wanted to cover. Um, tomorrow's meeting, first meeting tomorrow morning starts at 930. Um, and then so he'll be doing the Sabbath school class. He'll be doing the divine service. And there'll be one in the evening. And then there's one Sunday morning as well. So lots of stuff going on. Um, if you are planning on coming on Sunday, Sunday's topic is hydrotherapy. And bring a washcloth because he's going to do some hands-on stuff. So... Um, also, this is something that's, that's very nice about self-supporting ministries, and it's something that, having been away from Heartland for quite a while, I'd forgotten, but <clears throat> when I called and asked how much they charged to come, he's like, pay the plane ticket. And if I need a rental car, rental car, provide me a place to stay, food to eat, and we're good. And uh, they survive on free will offerings. So we have... In the back of the church, on the left-hand side, there's a, a wooden box about this big by this big and about that tall. Any money gets stuck into there will go to Walt as a free will love offering. So if you feel so inclined, that's where it will go. And then when Walt leaves Sunday, he will be given the complete contents of that box. So if you put a $1,000 bill in there, I'm sorry, but there's no change. <laughs> right, Walt? <laughs> Um, seems like there was something else I needed to say too, but I can't remember what it is. Yeah, I, I said that. Yes, that's right. That was the other thing. Thank you. Um, we are streaming this on YouTube. We have Zoom set up and these videos. I've talked to Walt and he's okay with leaving them up. So after this is all done, if you want to go back and review and pick up stuff you may have missed, it will be on YouTube on the Fredericktown Seventh day Adventist. Sound room, YouTube station. When we first set it up, we didn't think it really long was going to be a problem, so we just we need to change our name. But anyways, so yes, it will be available um, to see again and again and again. So um, I, for any of you that haven't been here, the restrooms out the back door and to the right. Um, there's also restrooms downstairs, the bottom of the stairs. Take a left down the hallway, and they're on the left. Um, I believe that's it. So, Walt, it's all yours, brother. There you go. Great. Well, good evening, y'all. How are you in this evening? Good. Well, it's good to be here. It's about this kind of temperature at home right now. It's supposed to be in single digits. Um, tonight, wind chill, wind chill is supposed to be in the un, below zero at home. Uh, but it's kind of crazy. We were, um, let's see here, last Sabbath we were in the 80s. And, um, and then even, um, let's see, we got snow this week. And the day before we were in the 80s, and the next night we were we were having snow. So uh, it's kind of a kind of tough on the immune system. Well, it's good to be here with y'all. It is. Um, <clears throat> I like little churches like this. It's good uh, in in the community in the country, and uh, we need to be in country living, not in the cities. When I go to New York City, uh, I'm a fish out of water. Uh, traffic's crazy. People kind of crazy too, um, <laughs> but the the um, it's nice to to see folks taking the the uh, the directive of being out of the city. Well, can we start with prayer? Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your love and your care. Lord, we ask that you give us wisdom tonight as we look at how to better take care of our bodies, how to be proactive, how to be reactive, so that we be we can be strong. And, and do what we need to do for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So optimal immunity, 
how to achieve it. Let's see if I can see how this is here. So optoimmunity, how to achieve it. Number one, what is the immune system? Things not to do, these are what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, things to do and things that you can take to help your immune system. Let's see, maybe I can st stand over here a little bit so I'm out of y'all's way. Uh, so what is the immune system? The immune system distinguishes self from non-self and eliminates potentially harmful uh, non-self molecules and cells from the body. The immune system also has the capacity to recognize and destroy abnormal cells that derive from host tissues. Any molecules capable of being recognized by the immune system is considered an, an antigen. The skin, cornea, mucosa and the, of the respiratory and gastrointestinal tract uh, form a physical barrier that is the body's first line of defense. Some of these barriers also have active immune functions. Can anybody tell me what organ in the body has the most effect on your immune system? Skin, heart. Actually, it's now said probably 75% of your immune system is determined by this one item. No, you're getting close. The colon. The colon. Can you imagine that? I was listening to one physician uh, at, from... Um, just up the road from where we used to be, up at, uh, Hop at Hopkins, and he said the colon should be like the rainforest. But what messes up the colon? Well, if we're drinking water that has chlorine in it, that's going to mess up what's... It. You've got chlorine killing the, the good bacteria. You've got antibiotics that mess up what's going on in the, in the colon. There's a lot of things that mess up the colon. So the colon is huge in taking care. You've got to take care of it in order to maintain a good immune system. And how do you do that? Um, choosing the right food is important. Processed food has a huge effect on the colon. Uh, I had a mother call me just, well, actually an uncle called me, and then I called his, this fellow's mother, and uh, he has colorectal cancer that's metastasized all over his body. And what's the major cause of colorectal cancer? Meat. meat. Red processed meat, well, red meat, and then processed meat. Uh, yes, um, meat's a huge, huge uh, impact on the colon. How about stress? Does stress affect? Absolutely it does, yeah. And then the chemicals that we ingest, the, when we were coming, Riding back from the airport, we were talking about the the effects of um, of how we we treat our food here in America. You know, you know. Can you imagine we eat food that has Roundup on it? Now, how many y'all grow a garden? Can you imagine? You know, let's say that you're growing some beans, some string beans, and uh, and and you say, well, we're going to pick a mess of green beans tomorrow. So today you go out and spray it Roundup. When I go to Minnesota and speak, and I go every year over out to Minnesota, I go at the time right at harvesting time, and, and it varies a little bit when I go, and sometimes it's before they spray the Roundup, sometimes it's when they're spraying the Roundup, this year was, it was after they sprayed the Roundup, and, they're, and it was all dead. Um, can you imagine eating Roundup? Well, y'all got corn here, y'all got soybeans, so I say y'all see it here also. Yeah. I can remember I was in there in Orange. <clears throat> I went to a neighbor and I said, uh, can I buy a five gallon bucket of soybeans from you? And he says, I ain't going to sell it to you. And I said, why? He said, you're my neighbor. What's that got to do with it? He says, you ever heard of Roundup? Yeah, we spray things. He said, we put it on our soybeans. I said, really? I didn't know about it back then. That was 20, 21 years ago. Uh, almost 20, yeah, tw over 21 years ago. And he said, uh, yeah, I won't sell it to you. Uh, it's kind of like I, I lived in a place where there's, anybody ever heard of Felspar? Felspar is what you make silicone chips from for computers. 
And I used to live in North Carolina where it has the, the purest felspar in the world. And um, they, there's a byproduct of sell, felspar that looks like just Panama City. Who's been to Panama City? White sand like it's in Panama City. It's beautiful, just plum white. And so I went and tried to buy some, and they wouldn't sell it to me. <clears throat> they said, uh, no, we won't sell it to you because you're, you're, you're from here. And I said, what do you do with it? Oh, we sell it over in Johnson City to them people, to the Tennessee people. Um, and I said, well, what's the problem with it? Well, it causes cancer. Well, I want to put it in for a sandbox for my kids. And they said, no, we don't want your kids in there. You're from here. But in Johnson City, they sell it to for those kids over in Tennessee, but not for local people. So <clears throat> as we look at what's on our food, and Roundup's just one thing. Uh, we have a deli, uh, a health food store and a deli, and the, um, the health department, State of Tennessee, comes in and is very regulatory. They come in, and I mean, they look at everything, like a magnifying glass. But in my produce section, I don't have to put what's on the produce. Tennessee requires, if I sold conventional food, I would have to list all the chemicals that are on the tomatoes and the carrots and, and all the food. It has to be listed what those chemicals are. Well, because I'm organic, I don't have to put anything. I just say organic. But there's so much that is put on, on food today. And if y'all grew up on, I grew up on a dairy farm. There weren't beef cattle. And, and so if y'all grew up on farms, y'all know what I'm talking about there. That affects the colon. Things not to do. Example. <clears throat> With heart disease, uh, example, heart disease, cancer, strokes, diabetes, and atherosclerosis, that's clogged arteries. Um, and this is from the United States Surgeon General. United States Surgeon General. Dietary excess and imbalance cause much disease and death. I'm giving an illustration. Dietary excess and imbalance causes much disease and death. Diet has a vital influence on health. Five of the top 10 killers what I just read, those five, are directly related to diet. This includes heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, and atherosclerosis. And I personally believe a number of those other five also have, uh, uh, are impacted by diet also. But especially these five here, definitely without a question, have a correlation with what we eat. It is clear that diet contributes in substantial ways to the development of these diseases. That's U.S. Surgeon General. And that modification of diet can contribute to their prevention and control. Now, I worked in regular health care for right at 20 years, and we spent most of our time just masking and managing health, uh, health problems. Um, and then uh, you'd ask, why did I change? Someone handed me a little book. Our head elder did and asked me to preach. And... Um, um, I read that little book, and he asked me to preach on what was in that book. And that book was, what do you think? Ministry of Halen. And um, I changed my career, left, and went, worked in Virginia. Where we did proactive, where for 20 years I'd never seen one patient reversing diabetes. Cardiovascular disease, we didn't see much aggressiveness on patients that, you know, had, you know, or, or, you know I'd say had an EF, of ejection fraction of 20. We just didn't see a lot of turnaround. Um, and then I go to a place that we had over a 98% reversal rate of type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is easy to reverse. Um, it's easier to reverse than toenail fungus. Um, the um, cardiovascular disease, we see significant improvement. Um, last year, Mary Lou started having some significant issues, so I took her to get her checked out. And I wanted a chest x-ray. She was having some, uh, some uh, fine crackles and some wheezing and went sleeping at night. So we did a chest x-ray. Radiologist said, I was just COPD. She had emphysema. Her daddy was a smoker, three pack a day. Lived at home till she left um, high school. Well, it got worse. Finally, she couldn't even do the stairs at the house to go upstairs. And, and I, so I took her to a friend of mine. I, physician there in town. I said, I need a diagnosis. Tell me what is wrong with her. 
So he pulled up the x-ray. I told him we'd done an x-ray, and he pulled up the x-ray, and he says, yeah, probably just COPD. That evening he called me back, and he said, well, bring her back over. It's very similar to what my wife died of two years ago. I need to rule that out. So we um, um, went back over, ran some tests, and she was in heart failure. We went to two cardiologists there locally. They were 180 degrees off, and so I called a, a very world-renowned cardiologist who is, is a thoracic surgeon in, in actually in um, California. He said, Walt, take her to UAB, University of Alabama at Birmingham. They said, I know those guys. I teach those guys. Go down there. So we went down there. Her ejection fraction was a 1015. Now, is that a good EF? No. When I watched on the echo, her literally, her left ventricle was just barely moving. Uh, significant back flush from the, from the mitral valve. Um, I said, what's going on here? So they went in, they looked, expecting that, you know, she had some major uh, atherosclerosis, and um, went in, and, and the, the physician said, I had hoped that we could do a, a, uh, a stent. I said, I don't think it's, I don't think it's that, because it's global, it's not localized. He says, you're right, it's, it's, it's global. Um, her vessels are totally clear, nothing. He's, the word was sparkly clear. So what's wrong? He said, there's significant damage that we can see in the heart. It's only caused by one thing. Has she ever taken a drug called adromycin? I didn't know. She goes, yeah, I took it 44 years ago when I had chemotherapy for, for when I was 15 years old. She took it for almost a year and a half. Heart had stopped twice, and they finally, after the second time it stopped, they quit using it. Um, he said, it's finally taken out your heart. And so at, they were looking at putting in a heart. Well, we started doing natural. Well, the last EF we got, we were up to a 2530. We didn't see that when I worked in regular health care. You know, we were at 1015, now we're up to a 2530, and we're seeing improvement. So does diet have an impact? Absolutely. Absolutely. But wait a minute, she was already on a good diet. So why did it happen? Well, sometimes the body can only handle so much. But through certain things like Hawthorne Berry, Coenzyme Q10, um, MSM, uh, magnesium, um, uh, L-carnitine, uh, vitamin C, we're seeing that left ventricle improving. And with the shrinkage of the left ventricle, we're now seeing better function out of the mitral valve because they were wanting to just put a mitral valve in. They said, at 10, 15, your heart can't even push through a new, a, a, a new valve we put in. So they couldn't even put it in. But function is much better because left ventricles run, run in a whole lot better. It's shrunk. And so the leaflets are, are they're able to close better. So doing natural, when you look at what are we dealing with, instead of just masking and managing, trying to be proactive, we find is much more effective. So how do we weaken our immune system? Um, if I had, if I took my arm and I took a piece of sandpaper and I started rubbing it, and you came up and you said, honey, let me put, me, put you some medicine on there. And you put some medicine on there and when you leave, I go to rubbing it. And then you come back later and you say, oh, you need some more medicine. I go to rubbing it again. Is it going to heal? No. Not until I stop using the sandpaper. Many times we study pharmacology more than we study physiology. We need to spend more time understanding physiology. And we actually, there's a, um, there's a quote that we're given that the more we understand physiology, the less and less use of medication we should use until we don't use any medication at all. That's a promise, y'all. That is a promise. It's in inspiration. And it says, the more we understand physiology, we'll use less and less dosing of medication until we don't use any medication at all. So type 2 diabetes is easy, I mentioned. Uh, but what about type 1? See, type 1, 
yes, I can see, let's say you come in and you're on, say, 60, 80 units a day of insulin. And it's pretty normal. We can get you down to 5, 10 units. But I don't know how to plumb at a large scale, be able to just plumb reverse the type 1. And if we said, well, quit taking the insulin. Now, is that going to be a good idea? No. But we just don't understand the physiology well enough yet. We've got to spend more time studying physiology so we can, like we now understand type 2, where we can correct those items, and then we then see the type 2 going away. We need to on the other diseases also that we haven't plumb figured out. So as we look at the immune system, you've got to look at what the cause is. Um, there was Dr. Arcella there when you were there. Joel Arcella. Joel was, he was a surgeon in Philadelphia. He was the top surgeon in his field. He was also, to make more money, a trauma physician uh, at night. Worked a lot of hours, made a huge amount of money. And one day God impressed him, stop doing what you're doing and do lifestyle medicine. So Joel did. Wife left him, kids left him because they missed the big old paycheck coming in. But Joel was extremely good in lifestyle medicine. And he had better outcome indicators than I did. So what do you do? You hire him on. So I hired Joel to come work for me and teach me what he was doing to have better outcome indicators like he was doing at his clinic. And Joel taught me, he says, Walter, if there's a problem in the body, you've got to identify the organ or the system that's causing the problem. Then you've got to stop, and then you've got to identify the organs, organs and systems that can affect that first organ. So let's say you're having digestive problems. What is another part of the body that can affect digestion? The brain? Can the brain affect digestion? Absolutely. Digestion it can affect brain. So, so if you have a brain issue, you want to address digestion. If you have a digestion issue, you want to address the brain and make sure that's not part of the cause. So Joel taught me, he says, well, you've got to identify the organ and system and the organs and systems that it can affect that primary organ or system, take anything away from it that is causing harm, and then provide it what it needs to recuperate. Does that make sense? Y'all farmers? Yeah, that's just what we call horse sense. <laughs> so as we look at what weakens our immune system, there's three major items. Number one is sugar. Number one, sugar. Number two is stress. Number three is, what do you think? Starts with an S. S sleep deprivation. Yes. Those three items will plumb take out your immune system. You can do everything right. You can be taking alley med. You can be taking uh, cordial silver, vitamin C, zinc, uh, elderberry, quercetin, knack, whatever. Everything. I mean... I mean, you can have a vitamin D level of 216 and get COVID. Now, you don't normally do a 216. Normally, it's 100. Uh, usually, you're fighting cancer at a 216. But anyway, and that's a normal procedure. But, well, not normal in regular health care. But I, can, I remember when, when our patient's uh, vitamin D was over 32, we thought, oh, that's too high. Well, 30 is the low end. Dr. Arvo Kana, who's a, uh, well, actually, he and I did this program together back several months ago. And Arvo, if you're, he's a neurologist. And if you're one of Arvo's patients, he does not want your vitamin D less than 60 for cognitive function. He specializes in the brain. Dr. Ted Watkins, surgeon in D.C., he doesn't want it below 80. He'd like you 90 to 100 for immune system. These guys right here will plumb take out your immune system even if you're doing everything else right. One or all three of them. So let's look at sugar. Besides being a driver behind the chronic health conditions like diabetes and heart disease, sugar consumption affects one's body's ability to fight off viruses or other infections in the body. Uh, white blood cells, also known as killer cells, are highly affected by sugar consumption. Sugar hinders the immune system by not allowing the white blood cells to do their job and destroy bad bacteria or viruses as well as when we do not eat sugar. 
Now, there's some slides I'm going to barely touch on because it gets a little deeper into to, to the science part, and so we'll just jump through it real quick. Um, so, if you have, um, these are white cells, and so if you have, let's say you have 14 white cells, and you have no sugar, all 14 white cells are working great. Um, six teaspoons, you're down to 10, 12, 5.5, 18, two, uh, two of them, 24, only one's working. What it does is it anesthetizes the white cells, like aneth it just kind of puts them to sleep for about four hours. So let's say, let's say you had a 12 ounce soft drink. Who's ever read Neil Nedley? Who's got his book, Proof Positive? Okay, in his book, Proof Positive, he talks about, um, he talks about soft drinks. So if you had, let's say, now when I was a kid growing up in Chattanooga, we could drink Dr. Pepper. <laughs> now we, weren't, we were not allowed to drink Coca-Cola's, but we could have Dr. Pepper's at church socials. Um, let's say you got you a, a Dr. Pepper. And um, a 12 ounce Dr. Pepper uh, will wipe out, according to Nedley in his book Proof Positive, will wipe out your immune system um, 50%, approximately 50% for up to four hours. Now, let's say you add a Snickers bar. Now, I'm not talking Snickers bars this long like they have in the stores today. I have gone to gas stations trying to buy Snickers bars for illustrations, and I can't even get the little ones like when we were kids. they got these guys. But the ones when we were kids this long, and a, um, and a regular soft drink, 12 ounce soft drink, will wipe out only, it'll wipe out 13 of, of 14 white cells. So you only have 1 14th of the immune system for the next four hours. You just took out 13 14ths according to Neil's research. That's huge. Let's say you, you, take, you drink a milkshake. Now we're talking just a normal size milkshake. Now, Neil did his research back in the 90s, so who knows what milkshake. I haven't had a milkshake in a long time. But just at that time in the 90s, it was just a normal milkshake. Was, um, it, would, it would knock it out 92 to 93% for four hours. A piece of cheesecake was the same thing, 92 to 94% for, for, uh, for four hours. So sugar will significantly wipe it out. So when I used to work in regular health care, I did a lot of teaching. And so I, I was in North Carolina, and I do um, I go across the state t teaching, um, and or go to meetings. And on the way, I'd stop in at a gas station, and I'd get me a Dr Pepper and a Snickers bar, uh, or two Reese's cups, <clears throat> and that was my extra fuel to get going. And then we get to the meeting, and we'd have danishes and donuts and whatever, and I'd enjoy those too. Now. Let's say that one of the fellows there, or ladies there, wasn't feeling too good, and they went and sneezed, and they rubbed their nose right before I walked up to them, and I shook their hand. And then I rubbed my nose. What happened? I'd blown my immune system before I even got there, eating those, that Snickers bar or Reese's or, and drinking that, that Dr. Pepper. And we wonder why we get sick. We do it to ourselves. Um... The average American eats approximately 22 teaspoons of sugar every day. That's huge. Um, 150 pounds of sugar a year and 79 pounds of high, high fructose corn syrup every year. And is high fructose corn syrup good for us? It's not. No. Uh, just kind of give you an idea here. People say, well, what about Gatorade? We can do Gatorade. Gatorade's almost as, as much as, uh, as, you know, well, it's half of what a Dr. Pepper is. The next one's sleep deprivation. Um, sleep deprivation's huge. And when I first moved back to Tennessee and people would come in and I'd work with their issues, health issues, stress was the big one, female hormones was a big one. But what I'm working with a lot today the most is sleep issues. People just can't sleep. And the problem with sleep is not, it's not a cookie cutter. 
I mean, you can take Benadryl and you take Benadryl and it puts you to sleep and it don't do a thing for you. On the drug side, um, in the same, I mean, it's chemicals. You got pharmaceutical chemicals, you got phytochemicals. And so people say, well, Walt, I tried melatonin, it just gives me nightmares. Well, it's true. I don't see melatonin working for a lot of people. In combination with some other things, I see it work better. And then you got valerian skullcap hops, passion fire, uh, chamomile, wild lettuce. There's a number of things you can take that are herbs, um, and they can help a person sleep. Um, you got ma uh, magnesium. Magnesium's excellent. I see that work very well. L-theanine works very well. Um, so you have to find that person specific and find out what works for them to help them to go to sleep. But there's some folks that are outliers out there. Just like some people use deodorant and they have to go every three, six months, change out and use a different deodorant because it quits working. Well, sometimes these phytochemicals which help a person fall asleep now don't work no more. And now you gotta go try another one. It's not a cookie cutter. You gotta find out which one works the best. Sleep provides essential support to the immune system. Getting sufficient hours of high quality sleep enables a well-balanced immune defense that features strong innate and adaptive immune immunity and less severe allergic reaction. Lack of sleep can affect your immune system. Studies show that people who don't get quality sleep or enough sleep are, are more likely to get sick after being exposed to a virus such as the common cold. Lack of sleep can also affect how fast you recover if you get sleep, if you get sick, um, do people sleep good out there? Are people getting their sleep? The average person who comes in and I ask them, uh, you know, what time do you go to bed? Midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock, some three, four, five. Um, and there's three things on sleep. Um, there, we used to think less than six hours was sleep deprivation. There was the Breezel Belloc study, or the Alameda County study, that Nedley refers to in his book, Proof Positive, uh, which was kind of the gold standard that we've used for many, many years. And in that study, at first they thought uh, less than seven hours was sleep deprivation at the nine year part of the study. It was 6,900 6, people in Alameda County, California. They w first did a nine year, then they ended up extending it to 15 years. At 15 years, they found actually less than eight hours caused a person to die quicker. But more than nine hours sleep caused you to die quicker too. So you're, you want that, that balance in there between eight and nine hours. But it's not just how many hours of sleep you get. Harvard has found that you need to be asleep as an adult by nine o'clock at night. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. It does. Um, Harvard finds there's something called the lymphatic system. Now, we know what the lymphatic system is. Well, when I was in school, we didn't learn that the brain had a lymphatic system, but it does. It's called the lymphatic system. Well, the lymphatic system kicks on around 9 o'clock and goes from 9 to 10, does a deep clean of the brain like the lymphatic system. Uh, it's, it's the sewer system. And then from about 10 to midnight, it does a, a good thorough clean and flushes the brain you got to be asleep. And how many people ain't flushing the brain? What would happen if you didn't flush the toilet at the house? <laughs> There's problems. Well, why are people having problems with stress, anxiety, depression? The brain just ain't working too good. Part of it, they ain't flushing it. So Harvard says adults need to be asleep by what? Nine, Nine o'clock. Well, we know from from what we've learned, the hours before midnight are worth twice the hours of midnight. Who knew Dr. Walter Strachan? Dr. Walter Strachan. He was a psychiatrist at Loma Linda. Strachan went to bed between 4.30 and 5. Got up at 1. Still got his eight, eight and a half hours sleep. But he was asleep. He understood those hours before midnight. Um, amazing. The next major, so we got hours of sleep, and, and, and hours of sleep, we, we see in the Bruzel Bellock study, less than eight is sleep deprivation. Harvard right now is saying, around, they were saying seven, now I'm seeing them say seven and a half, but they sure are talking a whole lot about eight. 
And I see them flirting with it. And I think we're going to see Harvard pretty soon say, no, less than eight hours of sleep deprivation. Then we see the hours before midnight. So it's just not eight hours of sleep. We need those hours before uh, midnight. But it's not just that. It's do you have contiguous sleep? Are you waking up all night long? See, you got different phases of sleep. There's four phases of sleep. And when you wake up, you start over. And there's folks that wake up every hour, hour and a half to go to the bathroom. Or, or y'all ladies, you wake up and you start worrying about the kids and the grandkids and you can't go back to sleep. Us, we worry about what we got to do the next day. And get, you, know, you know what I'm talking about? So you need that contiguous sleep. Those, those hours of sleep, so we can get through those, those stages of sleep, we can get that good REM sleep. So there's a number of things that we've got to worry about in order to have this component to help us with our immune system. Stress. Stress is the number one diagnosis in America. Stress is the current number one diagnosis in America. According to WHO, depression will surpass that in the United States shortly. And that was, WHO was saying that in January of 20, uh, 2020, before the COVID issue. Do you think we see more depression with COVID? Absolutely. So I think it's going to even be stepped up. Stress, number one diagnosis today. Many of today's illnesses and diseases are triggered by chronic stress. And we're going to talk about stress tomorrow morning uh, for Sabbath school. Which depresses the immune system and wreaks havoc on every organ in the system. This is from Psychology Today. Wreaks havoc on every organ. Exactly how stress causes and contributes to disease is a question of particular interest to two researchers. There are two likely pathways. One is behavioral. People under stress sleep poorly and are less likely to exercise. They adopt poor eating habits, smoke more, don't comply with medical treatment. Stress also triggers a response by the body's endocrine system, which releases hormones that influence multiple other biological systems, including the immune system. Now, who's ever seen this picture? You'll see that in Proof Positive. Now, when I was doing this presentation with Dr. Kana several months ago, I talked about this. It says one minute of anger can support, suppress your immune system for six hours. Six hours. It's worse than sugar. Longer than sugar. And so I asked Arvo, I said, we're, we're here speaking to a bunch of folks. They were physicians and healthcare folks. And Arvo's standing there, and I said, Arvo, help me out here. You're a neurologist. You specialize in the brain. It says, one minute of anger, physiologically in the brain, how similar is anger and stress? He goes, very similar. I said, can I substitute stress there? He goes, absolutely. Absolutely. Do you all have one minute of stress a day? <laughs> Major stress, someone calls in an uh, angry customer or someone cuts you off or whatever crazy happens today. One minute of anger can suppress your immune system for six hours or stress. Stress is huge. So things not to do. Eat sugar, sleep deprivation, stress. We're going to talk a few more things. Poor diet, vitamin D deficiency, alcohol, obesity, smoking, dehydration, and internet addiction. Is that a problem today? It's huge. So let's look at a poor diet. Diets that are limited in variety and low in nutrients. Now, this is interesting. Limited in variety and low in nutrients. How many of y'all watched the movie uh, Forks Over Knives? Any of y'all? Campbell, and I took nutrition from Campbell at Cornell. And T. Colin Campbell is an amazing guy. I mean, he's just like sitting here talking with each other. He's a great guy. And, Campbell's, and Campbell actually, he's the one who coined the phrase plant-based diet. Campbell says it needs to be a whole food, plant-based diet, but he says with variety. Now, did you know that Fruit Loops are plant-based? <laughs> they are? Yeah. How about Oreos? Yep, Oreos are plant-based. But it's not whole food. 
It's not what's whole food. Well, what's pro it's other than processed is what it is. Whole food, plant-based, but very, very important. Campbell just really just really drilled into our heads. Variety. We're not dogs. We don't eat same-o, same-o. We need a variety of food. Today, we can look on the label and see what's in food. But how did old-timers look and determine what foods to eat with variety? The color. The colors have similarities. So my grandmother, my great-grandmother, they would look at having plates with multiple color on it. Yes, it looks pretty, and then it makes him happier, and it's prettier on the plate. But it's more nutrition with multiple color. And, but you need food with variety, so you eat not same -o, same -o all the time. So diets that are limited in variety, low in nutrients, what we call calorie dense, not nutrition dense, such as consisting primarily of ultra-processed foods, can negatively affect a healthy immune system. It is also believed that in a Western diet high in refined sugar and red meat and low in fruits and vegetables can promote disturbances in healthy intestinal microorganisms. And we're going to see more and more research here. MIT is doing a lot of research here. Harvard's doing a lot of research here as we look at the biome that's going on in that colon, in the gut. Um, resulting in chronic inflammation of the gut and associated uh, suppressed immunity. Um, I'm working on another degree and one of the classes I took a couple, I guess one or two semesters ago, I don't remember. And, and these nutrition courses are just, they're talking about what's going on in the colon what's going on in the digestive system, protecting the digestive system, protecting the stomach. Have we heard that before? A hundred and how many years ago? It was Friday. Um, General Lee was uh, taking his, his Northern Virginia Army from Fredericksburg over to Culpeper. Which church did you go to? Orange? Okay. So Fredericksburg is over where they had those shootings back about 20 years ago. That fellow and his son were shooting people at the gas stations and malls. That was Fredericksburg. Culpeper. Have you ever seen those flags that have the don't tread on me, the yellow flag? That was actually during the Revolutionary War and it was the Minutemen of Culpeper came up with that flag. So Lee has taken his soldiers on a Friday morning, June 5th, 1863. And they're heading from Fredericksburg over to Culpeper. The northern uh, generals found out about this, told Lincoln. Lincoln said, let's send Hooker down and see if he can cut off Lee and destroy the, the northern Virginia army. He, Hooker took off as Lee's coming across and they missed him. He missed Lee. Lee made it to Culpeper Friday night, and then they kept on going to the Virginia, uh, to the uh, Shenandoah Valley, cut north, went into Maryland, what went into West Virginia, Maryland, pa uh, Pennsylvania, and what battle happened? Gettysburg. Gettysburg. Yeah, yeah. If Hooker had cut them off, there wouldn't have been a Gettysburg. So that was June 5. 1863. Now, that same day, there was uh, a couple in Battle Creek, uh, uh, Elder White and Mrs. White, and they were heading over to Otesco, Otesco? I'm not sure how to pronounce that town, Ostego, Ostego, Michigan. And there was a, 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 a um, they were doing an evangelistic series, and they were going over to um, to support them. Again, June 5, 1863. And right before sunset, it was on a Friday, they got to the people's house they were staying at, and uh, they were going to have sundown vespers and prayer. And so the man of the house asked Mrs. White to have a, uh, a prayer to welcome in the Sabbath. Um, she started praying, put her hand on Elder White's shoulder, 
and she went into a vision. Do you know what vision that was? It was a health message. Diet. We've known this stuff since the day that Lincoln um, told Hooker to cut off um, General Lee. That's been a long time, y'all. Has it not? But here's what's interesting. When she writes about this vision, she says it's June 5th. 6th. I'm sorry, June 6th. That's weird. So I went to the calendars and went back, and sure enough, Friday was June 5th. The sci- and the history says that this march from Fredericksburg to Culpeper was on the 5th. But she says the vision's on the 6th. There's only one thing I can think of. So I called the White Estate. I said, did something happen after sundown here? And he said, yes. He said, our pioneers, when the when sun went down, they changed the date on the calendar. Midnight is not Genesis 1. Is it true? true. Yes. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Um, so we've known this information for a long time. And what are we doing with it? Yeah. She talks about protecting the stomach, protecting the digestive system. And now we're finally seeing stuff coming out of these guys saying, protect that stomach, protect that digestive system. So far ahead. Vitamin D deficiency. uh, Deficiency in vitamin D is associated with increased autoimmunity uh, and an increased susceptibility to infection. Now, here's the problem with vitamin D. I've got a good friend of mine. He actually teaches a Sabbath school class I go to. Uh, He's uh, he's a physician, and he actually is lifestyle medicine. It's what his, 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 uh, 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 let's see here, um, something like lifestyle medicine. It's a little different, but that's his specialty, though he doesn't do that. He does the drugs. Um, He will tell you that 5,000 milligrams of vitamin D a day is sufficient for everybody. Nobody needs to take any more. Well, I had this lady come in. Her vitamin D was uh, 12. Now, is that low? Yes. And I asked her, how much D are you taking? She said 5,000. I said, okay. Let's bump it up to 5,000 twice a day. She bumped it up to 5,000 twice a day, and she went to 17. It was either 17 or 18. I said, hmm. Now, this is three months that we did vitamin D, 5,000, twice a day, three months, because she, she tests her blood every three months. There's a doctor in town does it for his cost once a quarter and just does it for the community, and so it's a good, really good deal. So she goes over there and gets it tested. So if three months, 5,000, twice a day, she only went to 17, 18. So I called a good buddy of mine, the surgeon in D.C. He's really big into vitamin D. And I said, uh, what do you think? He goes, do 20,000 BID, 20,000 twice a day. Okay, so we did 20,000 twice a day. Did that for three months. She went to 24. And then shortly thereafter, I mean very shortly after, I I saw some research one morning, and later that day, the surgeon called me and says, Walt, I just saw some new science that came out today. It said magnesium, deficient in magnesium, deficiency in magnesium affects vitamin D. I said, I saw it this morning also. He said, pumpered bowel tolerance. So... I told her, I said, let's go to bowel tolerance. Now, what's bowel tolerance? That's, well, you take magnesium until you get green apple two-step. Y'all know what green apple two-step is. That's a loose stool, the two-step. Green, eating too many green apples gives you the two-step. That's the green apple two-step. So you go to bowel tolerance to wh- just under what will give a loose stool. Okay, let's do it. So we stayed at 20,000 twice a day, did the magnesium, tested three months later. We were at 94 or 97. So it's not how much you take it a day. It's what's your blood level. That's the thing you got to take a look at. Now, there's people I know that will say, well, don't pay attention to labs. No, I like, and I like diagnostics, some. I mean, I had this lady call me one day, and she said, my husband's bleeding from the rectum. What do I do? I said, I don't know. I don't know if, she has, if he has ulcerative colitis. I don't know if he has cancer. I don't know if he has hemorrhoids. I don't, a polyp that's bleeding. You need to look in there and see, and I can't do that. 
You need to look in there and see why is he bleeding. And then once we know why, then we can do something. Had a lady come in this week. She came in with her husband and gave me a big old hug. She says, I just want to tell you thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, she says, but first, before I tell you thank you, i got to say thank you to God. I said, you're right. What happened? She says, well, you know that stuff you've been having me take for the last three years for my polyps and my colon, and I had colon cancer? Yes. It was slippery on marshmallow root, psyllium, pineapple, uh, uh, peppermint, and spearmint. Two tablespoons a day. She says, I just left the doctor. There ain't no polyps. There ain't no cancer. Isn't God good? God's really good. Um, so I lost my place on that one. I'm telling you that story. Um, where was I? Yes, the mag magnesium. Yes, thank you. So the magnesium you do to bowel tolerance. Bowel tolerance is where you... Uh, oh, that lady, her husband was bleeding from... Colon. So you need diagnostics. You need diagnostics. Um, so magnesium can help with vitamin D absorption. So it's not just what your blood level is. It's, uh, it's not just how much you take a day. It's what is your blood running. Research shows that vitamin D plays an important role in immune function, and a deficiency in it is shown to increase one's susceptibility to infection. Vitamin D deficiency can mean your immune system is more vulnerable. Also, um, there's a, there's a, you, who's ever seen Tune In Radio? Tune In Radio. I'll listen to, you know, uh, different, uh, like uh, VBN for nice, they've got decent music on there, uh, or 3ABN or whatever. I'll, I'll listen to Tune In Radio. Well, there's one called Reach MD, and it's where medical doctors can get uh, CMEs on there, and they have late, just cutting edge science that comes out in, in sections about 20 minutes long. And, and uh, you can go on their computer and, and get more information. Well, they came out and said that there's a direct relation. Yes, there's a direct relationship with vitamin D and immune system. But they found that also there's a direct relationship with vitamin D and HDL. So if you want to pump your HDL up, the good cholesterol, check your vitamin D. It could be if you boost your vitamin D, you'll pull your HDL up also. Low levels of vitamin D have been associated with frequent infections. In 2009, Nas uh, uh, the National Institute, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in 2009, the National Institute of Health warned that low vitamin D levels are associated with frequent colds and influenza. Uh, alcohol, do you think that affects our immune system? Alcohol consumption uh, compromises the body's immune system. This is the World Health Organization. Increases the risk of adverse health outcomes. It's a combination. You just make, as I go into the school system, I teach in the public school system, and I teach the eight laws of health. Can you imagine? I used to say, uh, when I get to that, the, the last T in, in New Start, I'd have to say, you know, pull out your, your, uh, your quarters or your money, and what's, what does the money have on it? I couldn't say trust in God. Well, now Tennessee law says that they have to have a sign in the school that says trust in God. Uh, in God we trust. In God we trust. Um, and I talk to the kids, and I say, what does drinking do? And the kids will say, it makes you make stupid decisions. Because they see mom and dad make stupid decisions. And that's what they'll tell me over and over and over. It makes you make stupid decisions. And there are. We make decisions that can compromise our immune system. Uh, not to mention what the alcohol in itself can do to the immune system. Alcohol can trigger inflammation in the gut. Inflammation in the gut is huge on lowering the immune system. That's what they're now finding. We've got, do we have to have inflammation? Yes, you've got to have inflammation. You'll fester if you don't have inflammation. We need some, just like we need cholesterol. Do we need cholesterol? Sure we do, but we don't need too much. But we need some inflammation, but the problem is we've got way too much inflammation. Uh, and inflammation in the gut lowers the immune system. More and more research is coming out. That's kind of the hot thing they're talking about. Uh, alcohol can trigger inflammation in the gut and destroy the microorganisms that live in the intestines and maintain immune system. That was uh, PubMed. Obesity. Obesity, like other states of malnutrition. Now, how can a person that's 500, I had a guy in Virginia, is 572 pounds. He was a big man. He was malnourished. 
Now, how is a person who's 572 pounds malnourished? Is eating the wrong thing. Usually when a person is 450, somewhere between 400 and 450, and I sit down and I say, what do you eat for breakfast? What time do you eat breakfast? What do you eat for dinner? What do you eat for dinner? What do you eat for supper? What time do you eat supper? Do you eat between meals? If so, what do you eat between meals? I can pretty well figure that person's going to be eating hot dogs, hamburgers, pizza, uh, soft drinks, and uh, potato chips. That's pretty well it. That's normal for that person. Is that person going to be malnourished? They're not. They're eating. They're eating um, calorie dense food, not nutrition dense food. So that mal- so a person who is obese can have malnutrition. Obesity, like other states of malnutrition, is known to impair the immune function, altering uh, uh, leukocyte counts as well as cell mediated immune responses. Smoking. Smoking harms the immune system and can make the body less successful in fighting disease. It does a lot of things. Um, dehydration. Hmm. There's a lot of dehydration out there. Um, I have people tell me, Walt, I just don't do water. And when I sit down with somebody, I'll ask them, I'll say, how much water do you drink? I used to say, do you drink enough, do you drink enough water? Oh, yeah, I drink enough water. Well, how much water do you drink? Glass? <laughs> or some people say none. Uh, or can I count the water in my coffee? <laughs> or can I count the water in my tea? Or my moonshine? That's another one they'll say. Can I count the water in my moonshine? I don't know if there's water in moonshine or not. I thought it was alcohol. Um, but uh, there's a lot of dehydration out there. And when you look at hydration, University of California at Davis said that it takes a half a gallon of water a day to run the brain and the body of a five-year-old. That's four water bottles. A five-year-old. Up to 128 pounds. But that's to sit on the couch. If you're farming, working in your garden, mowing the yard, construction work, firefighting, you need more. Now, the state of Tennessee tells me I'm supposed to drink a gallon of water a day. Water. I need to be drinking water. I'm sorry. I'm talking about drinking water. And so, I'm supposed to drink a gallon of water a day because I'm a firefighter. And then if I have a house fire, I'm supposed to drink water in rehab and after the house fire. If I fight fire with the United States Forest Service or the Park Service, Used to, they told me I was supposed to drink a gallon of water every two hours. Now it's every hour and a half is what we're supposed to drink water. Um, water is very important. Over 128 pounds, it's body weight divided by two. Now, about a year ago, I was taking a class, and uh, we had to get a bunch of lab equipment to do different functions. And one of the items that we had to monitor was hydration. So who's best to learn on? Yourself. Learn on you. Then learn on your family. Try it on your wife and try it on your kids and grandkids and whatever. They ain't going to sue you. And then you start working on other people. Well, so what the professor had us do is he had us just measure our hydration for you know several days and see where we were. Most of us were dehydrated. And then he said, take your body weight, divide it by two. You need that many ounces of water a day. And that's pretty standard out there today. Body weight divided by two, that many ounces. So um, we, um, we did that. Body weight divided by two, that many ounces a day. Hydration improved. But still, most of us were not adequately hydrated. And then he went and uh, showed us research from a physicist who was a genius. He was friends with Einstein. He was from Orlando, Florida. It was interesting. The man was a Seventh-day Adventist. And this physicist down in Orlando, Florida, back in the 30s, he found that drinking water a certain way makes a difference in how well the body is hydrated since the 1930s. Um, And here's what he said to do. 
when you drink water, well, first of all, and we have studied this in, in physiology, when you drink more than um, three to four ounces at a given time, it goes into what's called free flow. So let's say I have a sponge, and I pour this water on that sponge. That sponge can absorb X amount. The balance will run all over the, the table. And let's say it's summertime. We put it out on the, on, the, on the picnic table, and we go by every once in a while and pour a little bit in there. What's going to happen? Evaporation. And it's not going to run all over the table as much. Well, what this physicist found was if the same thing. Well, he said four ounces. The, the physiology books that I, I remember back in school said between three to five ounces. This physicist said four ounces. If you drink more than four ounces, it's going to go to free flow. So he was right in the middle of what I learned in school. So what happens many times? Now, is it good to have free flow? First thing in the morning, it's good to have free flow. You know where you get that, that warm water, put your lemon in there, and drink it all down? It's going to what? It's going to flush out the urinary tract. And that's good from the night before. But then for the, so you don't count that water. That was just a clean out. The net rest of the day, what this physicist said, do this three to four times every hour except about 15 minutes before you eat, while you eat, to about an hour after you eat. Where do you think he got that information? That's it. He said, do that three to four times every half hour. But make sure. Now, we know today, body weight divided by two. But again, that's to sit on the couch. If you're out farming and gardening or, or working in construction or firefighting or whatever, you need more than that amount. Because body weight divided by two is to sit on the couch. If you're sweating more, then you need more. Like, in the summertime, do y'all need more than weather out there right now? Yes, absolutely. Dehydration affects the immune system. Significant positive correlations were found between severity of dehydration and changing, well, I'll just, it's, these are factors that we measure immune system. These results uh, suggest that dehydration resulted in immunosuppression including decrease in neutrophil function. Now this is an interesting one. Internet addiction. Are folks addicted to the internet? When I got to Knoxville this morning and I sat down, what were people doing? When I was in Charlotte, what were they doing? I mean, I see people texting each other sitting beside each other. It's like they can communicate better on here than they can by out of their mouth. Um, have you seen people who, young kids that just can't orally communicate well now? They can't carry on a conversation. They can't look you in the eye because they're not used to looking people in the eye. They're used to looking this in the eye. And they, it's these little short, they don't even do full sentences on here. And if they do, it's a sentence. Well, some like to type a whole bunch, but, but a lot of them just, and they're done. I mean, they just, they can't communicate good. Can you imagine if they didn't have this? What withdrawals they go through? Internet, have you all had uh, Scott Retzmuth up here? Any great? I mean, so you all know about this. Internet addiction, internet addiction can damage immune function. People with excessive internet use have 30% more cold and flu symptoms than those with less problematic internet usage. And I'll it, it will reference the, this research. Those who spend excessive time on the internet tend to have greater sleep deprivation, worse eating habits and less healthy diet, Engaged in less exercise, tend to smoke and drink more alcohol. So, uh, 
There we go. So is it my cell phone, is it the cell phone of itself that causes the, dis the reduction in immune system? I don't know. Remind me Sunday. And I'll show you, uh, ha who's heard of Macola? Have you seen his, his video on skid marks disease? I'll show you all that Sunday before we go into hydrotherapy. It's called skid marks disease. He found out that every wreck had skid marks pretty well. And the cause of the wrecks must be skid marks. <laughs> because there's skid marks at all wrecks. You got to get to root cause. And he talks on what that root cause of wrecks is. It's not skid marks. So what is the cause here? It's not my cell phone. It's not the computer. Sleep deprivation, nutrition, uh, less exercise, smoking, and alcohol. Is that not what we were just talking about a few minutes ago? It's just when you are, have internet addiction, you're more prone to those problems. I mean, kids won't sleep at night because they're up talking. There might be something said. They might miss something on Facebook. So as we look at these things not to do, sugar, sleep deprivation, stress, a poor diet, vitamin D deficiency, alcohol, obesity, smoking, dehydration, internet addiction, these are just some of them, but it's the sandpaper. As, as Arcella taught me, take away the things that harm first, and then you can then start giving the body what it needs. So what are things that we do need to do? Number one is prayer. And I'll talk about this tomorrow on stress. Uh, but I won't read these, nine, these here, but look at Psalms 91. Look at Psalms 103. Huge, huge that can help you. WHO, this is what WHO said the March of 2020. This is what WHO said March of 2020 for immune system. Wash your hands regularly. Soap and water. Uh, rub, uh, alcohol rub, rub if not visibly dirty. We know that some bugs, some pathogens are killed better with soap and water and some pathogens are killed better with alcohol. So just use both of them. I, get, I definitely get it. But washing hands is huge. I, I don't discredit that at all. I remember I used to tell my staff, when you come to, when you come to work, wash your hands. Um, after you do patient care, before you do patient care, after you do patient care, between eye drop, between left eye, right eye, wash your hands. Uh, before you eat, after you eat, uh, you know, at least after you go to the bathroom, before you smoke, after you smoke, many times. Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Very, very important. Practice uh, respiratory hygiene. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing. Throw the tissue into, the closed bin, uh, into a closed bin. Wash your hands. <clears throat> do you remember when we were kids and we had a snotty nose, what did our granddad do? He pulled out that handkerchief and rub your, blow in it, boy. And then to your brother, blow in it, boy. <laughs> do you remember those days? No, we don't want those handkerchiefs anymore. Throw it away. Use, use something disposable. Now, this is interesting. Um, I changed this. Actually, I changed this one. Um, actually, in March of 2020, it had one meter, only three feet is all it recommended distancing. And then when COVID came out, WHO went to two meters. Avoid touching your eyes, mouth, and nose. Why is that? Yeah, the orifice, that's how it gets in. That's, yes. Mask and personal protective equipment if you're sick when caring for other, someone who is sick in a healthcare setting. That is the only time WHO was recommending uh, that um, at March of 2000. Now, yes, if, uh, I, I, I do a lot of work with Rwanda and actually even worked with the, uh, the w, uh, WHO director there. And, uh, I mean, because of Ebola, I mean, those guys are on it. Uh, and they, I mean, soon as COVID started, in their country, they were masking up because they were because they were used to Ebola. 
and we won't go into the other issues there. Uh, if you are unwell, stay home. If you have a fever, cough, or difficulty breathing, uh, seek early medical care. I was flying somewhere. I have no idea where I was flying. But, uh, was a couple years ago, I was flying somewhere, and this fellow sitting beside me is from uh, Sweden. And my family, on my mama's side, is from Sweden. And uh, so I thought, boy, I learned a little bit about my family's history. And so I was talking to him about m- many different areas, about what it's like in Sweden. Um, there you can't whoop kids. Can you imagine not being able to whoop kids? Um, and, uh, but he said, health-wise, if you're sick, the employer does not want you at work. Don't come to work. Because in their socialized medicine, it's a, it's a drain on the whole mentality, you know, the, the system, because it's, a, it's, it's socialized. And so, you know, don't take us down by you being sick. So you stay home. You know, don't get rest of us sick. And actually, he said, when a person's an alcoholic, a drug user, he said they actually, uh, they actually, um, oh, what's the word for it? Um, you know, they, what's it when you don't go around people? Uh, shun them. Yes, they shun them. Because that alcoholic, that drug user, costs money on the system. And they have in their mind socialized, you know, take care of the system. Um, but I thought it was interesting. He said, if you're sick, the employer has no problem with you staying home. Don't get everybody else sick because that will affect productivity. Uh, things to do, a healthy diet. Um, a balanced diet consisting of a range of vitamins and minerals most effectively uh, primes the body to fight infection and disease. Harvard P- School of Public Health. Um, do people eat that? No, for the most part, they're not. Um, when I ask people what they eat, I have people literally come into me and tell me that they do not cook at their home. They do not prepare food at their home. Everything is, is eaten out at some type of uh, either fast food or some type of a restaurant. There's, in New York City, they're now building apartments that don't have kitchens. They have little areas, and they're called nuking centers. Nuking centers. They've got a little mini refrigerator, they've got a little bit of sink, and they have a place for a microwave. And that's their kitchen. Can you imagine? Um, eating enough nutrients is, uh, as part of a varied diet, and here's you know, here we're seeing again varied with variety, <clears throat> is required for health and function of all cells, including immune cells. So eating enough nutrients, that means food that is nutrient-dense. Where's the best place to find nutrient-dense food in the grocery store? <coughs> the produce section and the frozen section. Now, this is something kind of a little different to think about. There are times that frozen food has more nutrition than the produce section because the produce section is not picked by and ripe many times. Frozen food is picked by and ripe and then flash froze within, a, within 24 hours. And so you can have actually more nutrition in frozen than you do fresh food from produce. Now, where is the best place to get your food? Your backyard. For numerous reasons. One, you know what's, what's in the soil. If nutrients aren't in the soil, it's not going to get up into the food. And so you need to do soil analysis. You need to amend the soil. Just like we've got to check our blood to see, you know, someone will come in and they say, well, do I need to take B12? I have no idea. What's your B12 level? I don't know. Your B12 might be 1,300. No, you're not B12 deficient. So, so just as we take labs to see what we need to do for our consumption, we need to see what the soil's labs are to tell how we need to amend that soil. 
Do we need to put soft rock phosphate? Do we need to put green sand? Do we need to put alfalfa? Do we need to put uh, blackstrap molasses? Do we need them in that soil to put the nutrients in the soil so, the, so that the plant can pull it up? The next thing is we were talking about on the way from the airport. Un uh, University of North Carolina, Department of Agriculture found the difference in the seed can be a huge disparity. They found, uh, after much research at University of North Carolina, Department of Agriculture, same soil in these various different areas, and they would put hybrid and they put heirloom. And consistently, the heirloom on average, only uh, the, the hybrid, I'm sorry, the hybrid only up took 40% of the nutrients that the heirloom pulled out. So what seed are you using? Is it pulling it out of the ground like it needs to? Um, the other is it being, is it being uh, harvested vine ripe? And we'll talk about that philosophy tomorrow afternoon. Are you going to get more nutrition in a mater that's green or one that's a little soft? Y'all know what maters are, right? <laughs> Tomatoes. <laughs> one of my suppliers out of England uh, we were talking one day, and he said, well, he says, we talk different. We say, you say tomatoes, and we say tomatoes. I say, no, we say maters. <laughs> so is that, who's, who's been on a farm and grown hay? You understand. As the hay grows, you pray that when it peaks in nutrition, it's not raining. That's what my daddy do. Because if you harvest it prior to you don't get as much nutrition for the cows or the horses or whatever. And then if it's raining and you have to let it go longer, you then it's a bell curve. You then start losing nutrients on the other side. It's gone too long. So you want at peak nutrition is when you harvest that hay. If you let your food go too long, you can start losing nutrition. So you want to pick it at vine ripe when it has the most nutrition. So there's a number of things. And you can control that in your backyard. Can you control that at the grocery store? No. Hydrotherapy, we'll talk about this one, so I won't really get into this one now. Uh, Sunday, we're going to do hydrotherapy. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but we know that taking a cold shower at the end of a shower increases the white cell count. That's pretty common. Uh, we know that a fever treatment, Loma Linda, Dr. Charles Thomas, who's ever heard of Dr. Charles Thomas? Thomas at Loma Linda found that uh, a fever treatment would increase your white cell count by sevenfold. I didn't believe it. No way. So I had my nurses draw labs on numerous patients that we did fever treatments on, and guess what? Thomas was right. Peaked at five hours on every single patient, no matter if they were, were doing fever treatments for cancer, for whatever. Peaked at five hours. Now, I didn't go longer than six hours on my labs uh, unfortunately, it peaked at five before it, it, so I got a peak. Six was the same. Dr. Harold Cherney, who's heard of Dr. Harold Cherney? Eden Valley. And he's in Chattanooga, and he's up at Shenandoah Valley. Cherney, he did research on a daily basis, lab draws, and he found that after a fever treatment, it did not come back to where it was at the prior to post-fever treatment, uh, I mean pre-fever treatment, um, until uh, three days. Now, at what point that bell curve started coming down for that seven times, I don't know. I, uh, I just didn't have the funds to do that long term of uh, testing. And we'll cover this kind of, we'll cover these items on um, um, Sunday. Using hot, cold contrast showers, bathing, or fomentations can powerfully optimize immune function, and greatly stimulate antibody production against viral and other forms of infection. Who may, who, how many of y'all know Dr. Youngberg? Youngberg. How to, yeah, that's his clinic there. Uh, I won't go into this. Um, so things to do, pray. Do the recommendations of just normal WHO stuff there. Healthy diet, hydrotherapy, um, 
I apologize, y'all. I'm a fire chief, and so I have to monitor when things come in, so I apologize. Um, sometimes it's a fire, and sometimes I have to call and answer stuff, so I apologize. Things to take. Vitamin D, garlic, onions, all of oregano, zinc, vitamin C, B6, vitamin E, elderberry, astragalus. Astragalus is really good. Uh, echinacea, another one. But be careful with your, um, your, your echinacea and your golden seal. Do not use echinacea and golden seal longer than two weeks. You want to pulse it. It's just like you don't do vank for six months, you know, uh, bank of ice. Um, and so some things you can use long term like garlic. And do I put... Um, I didn't put uh, olive leaf. Olive leaf's another real good one. Olive or oregano, you can do that long term. Um, but your echinacea, your golden seal, you can't do long term. Um, you, so what you do is you do it for two weeks, stop two weeks, so you can pulse it. Golden seal, echinacea, golden seal, echinacea, you want to use those too. Uh, iodine, uh, NAC. Uh, NAC is, um, it got a little difficult to get a couple months ago. The FDA tried to take it away, and the industry sued them, and so there's a stay on that order, um, and, uh, the, and um, you can have a bottle of NAC, and it is three, nine, nine, yeah, it's, let's say that bottle's $25, it's $350 at the drugstore, the same bottle in our local community. Um, so that's a challenge. Um, how would time wise, how long we what do we want to do? Okay. Vitamin D helps our immune system stay balanced during the cold and flu season and serves and serve as a uh, uh, as a uh, pharmacy resource. Isn't that interesting? There are vitamin D receptors and activating enzymes on the surface of all white blood cells. The role that vitamin D plays in keeping the immune system healthy is very complex because the immune system has to be perfectly balanced. If there is too much uh, stimulation, autoimmune disease can set in. If there is not enough immune system activity, I'm sorry, not enough immune system activity, frequent infections can occur. Garlic. Allicin is an active ingredient of garlic that has antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, and antiprotozoal activity. This past summer, no, it wasn't, I'm wrong. Um, this past fall, I'm trying to think. The fall. A physician called me and he said, uh, Walt, I've got COVID. What do I need to do? So I shared with him some things to do. Called me a week later and he didn't, say, he didn't even sound like himself. He said, Well, I'm bad. I'm in. I'm in uh, ICU. Um, I'm, I'm doing really bad. What do I need to do? I said, did you do what I told you last week? He goes, no. I said, okay, that's what you need to do. <laughs> but now, because you're now having major respiratory issues, you need to add you know, hot and cold fomentations. You need to do mullen. You need to do echinacea. I'm sorry. Uh, you need to do eucalyptus. Um, he says, can you come down here and do it for me? I said, you're in the hospital. They won't let me into ICU. He goes, yeah, you will. I'm the hospitalist. I'll do what I tell you. You know what I tell them. Yes, yeah, so you can come down and do them. I said, well, I still can't because I'm flying out tomorrow to speak like I can now. And I said, I'd, I'd, I, otherwise I'd be down there doing it for you. I'd have no problem doing it. Um, what an opportunity to go into ICU and do hydrotherapy. You know? Well... Guess what happened? His wife's a nurse. And I said, put your wife on. So I told her what to do. And so she did. The wife comes in. She's a nurse. And she does, she does hydrotherapy treatments in the ICU. Um, and that, it was their COVID ICU unit. Um, and he did very well. He did very, very well. He used something called Alimed. And Alimed is a strong garlic. It has 24 cloves of garlic to make one drop. So he's taking it by mouth, and then he was nebulizing it because he also had pneumonia. He called me later, uh, three months later, and he said, um, he said, well, I just went to the pulmonologist, 
no, I'm wrong. One month later, he called me. One month later, he called me. He said, I just went to the pulmonologist, and he said, the pulmonologist has not seen a person's lungs clear out this good until at the earliest three months. He says, I'm doing great. He said, I'm doing great. But then he called me a few weeks ago, all excited. He said, well, you won't believe what just happened. I need to tell you what I just did. I said, what? He said, um, I had two patients this week, uh, or no, a little, almost, it was about a week. And uh, he said, um, he said one of them we were getting ready to put on the vent, and the other one was just about there. And both families came and begged me, don't put them on the vent. Please don't put my family on the vent. They'll die. He said, okay, then you do what I tell you. He said, I want you to bring in garlic. At that hospital, they're allowing the family to come in and be with the patient. He said, I want you to bring in garlic to both families. And I want you to give them a, clo a clove of garlic every waking hour to eat. And he says, I'll give them vitamin C. And he gave 3, 35,000 uh, milligrams of vitamin C IV. The fellow, they were just that, just getting, I mean, literally getting ready to put him on the vent right then. And the family talked him out of it when he went to tell them, we're going to put your, your family member on the vent. He was totally off oxygen in four days, getting ready to discharge. The guy that was almost there, but not quite, he had already discharged perfectly in good shape. I said, so what happened on the floor? What did they say? He said, they thought I was crazy. The nurses and the other doctors. I said, what do they think now? He said, they ain't saying nothing. <laughs> Not all hospitals would allow that to happen. Not all hospitalists would do that. Garlic is very, very powerful. I said, well, what about my alley med? You give him alley med? He goes, well, I can't go that far and take alley med in the hospital to the patients. Uh, Alice, uh, he took it himself, but he just can't prescribe it to him. But he could tell him bring food in. Is garlic food? Yeah. yeah. Allison exhibits various biological properties like antimicrobial, anti-cancer, antioxidant, immunomodulatory, anti-inflammatory, hypoglycemic, and cardiovascular effects. It's amazing. It is phenomenal. Just go ask some Asian person. They'll tell you about garlic. Garlic appears to enhance the functioning of the immune system by stimulating certain cell types, such as macrophages, uh, macrophages lymphocytes, and natural killer cells, NK cells, uh, dendritic cells, and eosinophilic, uh, and eosinophils by mechanisms including modulating in cytokine secretions, immuno, immuno, uh, immunoglobulin uh, production, uh, phagocytosis, and macrophage activity. And that's from the Journal of Immune uh, RES. I forgot what RES stands for. Garlic is powerful, super, super powerful for the immune system. Onions. Are onions like garlic? Yes. Very similar. Onions, the Alice and Septa, uh, Sepa, uh, which uh, allium, allium is what's in also in the, so how do you get our allicin? Allicin is the component of garlic that is, builds immune system. And you take two components in the garlic, smash it together. That's why when you, you want to smash your garlic. And you smash them together. It's kind of like making an epoxy. Who's ever done epoxy? So you put the two together, mix it together. Well, when you smash the garlic, it makes like an epoxy. Puts the two together, and it causes the allicin. The problem is allicin stabilization is very short. And so that's why you, sometimes you have to use something that, uh, that's stabilized. Uh, but if you don't have that, just smash it and use it right then. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Immune-boosting food rich in uh, uh, fruit tans. Uh, oil of oregano. Who's used oil of oregano? Oil of oregano is like a 44 Magnum. I mean, it's amazing. It, if you catch it in the incipient stage, in my turnouts, in my fire coat, I have in this pocket here, in my coat pocket, I have a bottle of oil of oregano, and I have big clippers that I can cut wire. That's in this pocket. 
because there's times that I'm out on the interstate because I-40 runs through where I am and we cover in the state of Tennessee I-40 and then I cover into North Carolina at least into the seven mile marker, sometimes up to the 15 mile marker of I-40. So we get a lot of crashes. Uh, and it might be in the middle of the night and it's cold like here. And uh, tonight, the temperatures are getting down to single digits where I live. And so if they're out, and you, you so what's the problem of being out there at night? Sleep deprivation. And so, I, you know, I get a big crash. Let's say there's a fatality. Big fatality, multiple. I'm waiting on them to come out of Chattanooga to come up and do a, a highway patrol investigation. I might be there for eight, nine hours. And happen to stay with the scene and leave those bodies there and I'm out in freezing cold weather, sleet and whatever. I'm, I'm getting sleep deprivation. I pull out my 44 Magnum and start taking the oil of oregano. Ten drops under the thumb. Don't take 100% oil of oregano. It's too strong. So you, you, you want it mixed. So I'll do a one to three. One part oil of oregano, three parts olive oil and then that I'll take like ten drops under the tongue and swallow it. Start with three. You might think I'm trying to key you uh, when you swallow it. But oil of oregano, if you catch it in the incipient stage, it's like Tamiflu. You've got to take it within the first 48 hours. Well, the same is true with your natural. Don't wait around. Hit it fast in the incipient, that beginning stage. You'll be a whole lot more effective. Uh, so if I start feeling something, I've got it on my side. Merlou's got it on her side of the bed, on her nightstand, so we don't have to crawl over each other and wake each other up. Um, I've got it in the vehicle. I've got it at my desk. So I just, there's no excuse. I can take it, and it will address the issue quick. Uh, oregano oil is a powerful plant-derived essential oil that may uh, rival antibiotics when it comes to treating uh, or preventing uh, various infections. This is a journal of medical food. Isn't that interesting? A rival to pharmaceuticals. All, uh, oregano oil contains properties that are antibacterial, antiviral, and antifungal. So what's the problem that we see out there today? Um, as we look at, um, at taking, you know, when a person has a... a an infection, um, we see that the majority of physician visits to office visits are upper respiratory infections. And there's over a million doses, I'm sorry, I'm wrong, over a million courses of antibiotics given each year, according to CDC, that are ineffective because they're antibiotics for viruses. So why are the docs given antibiotics? Because you want them. You went to the doctor. What's he going to do? He gives drugs. If you have a virus, is he going to tell you, well, there's nothing I can do? Well, they are starting to do that. But mom's in there saying, i got to have something for Johnny. You better give me something. Well, so yeah, he's going to give you something, but it, it's not going to do that. If he gives you an antibiotic, an antibiotic for a virus, is it going to do the job? No, but, is, but this one, this pharmacy, not P-H-A, but F-A-R-M-A-C-Y. F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, farm. God has given us an antibiotic and antiviral. We just learned garlic is an antiviral. All oregano, antiviral. Um, Olive leaf extract, antiviral. Uh, lemongrass, antiviral. God has given us antivirals. What are we dealing with out there today? A virus. All of oregano contains properties that are antibacterial, antiviral, and antifungal. Zinc. Zinc is a mineral that, uh, that's important to the body in many ways. And it's true in many ways. Zinc keeps the immune system strong, helps heal wounds, and support normal growth. It's also extremely important for thyroid function. Um, if you have a person that is hypothyroid, zinc can, can be one of the beneficial items. Vitamin C. 
Vitamin C is one of the largest immune system boosters of all. Vitamin C is one of the largest immune system boosters of all. Is that expensive? No. In, in fact, lack of vitamin C can even make you more prone to getting sick. So if you're not, if you don't have enough vitamin C, it's not just that vitamin C can help you if you are sick or build your immune, but if you're lacking in it, you're more prone to be sick. Foods rich in vitamin C, guava, kiwi, strawberry, cat. did you know? I went to a seminar one time by this lady. She was the nutritionist for the United States Navy SEALs. Now, do you think she is pretty good if she is the Navy SEALs nutritionist? They're our best guys out there. Uh, yes, she was good. She said there's more vitamin C in the cap of a strawberry than in an orange. She said, so when you're making your smoothies with, with strawberries, just leave them caps on. You put six strawberries in there, eight strawberries in there, that's more than the vitamin C of six or eight oranges. And they're actually now, you're, they're now uh, there are some vitamin Cs that come from strawberry caps in the making of uh, oranges, broccoli, kale. Daily intake of vitamin C is essential for good health because your body doesn't produce or store it. Cleveland Clinic. Daily intake of vitamin C is essential for good health because your body doesn't produce or store it, according to that little community hospital called Cleveland Clinic. Is that a community hospital? No, it's a big old hospital. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to vitamin C. Do you remember how we used to drink orange juice, a quart of orange juice when we were sick? Well, I went to a seminar by a buddy of mine. He's a physician. And he said, don't drink orange juice if you're sick. Don't, he said, matter of fact, don't drink any fruit juice when you're sick. And I'm thinking, Phil, what are you doing there? We always gave our patients orange juice and drink a bunch of it. You know, it's good for you. Apple juice, it's good for you. But especially orange juice because of the vitamin C. Well, I didn't say anything. Phil's my buddy. So I waited till after. I said, Phil, what are you talking about? He said, when was that orange juiced? How many weeks ago was it juiced down in Plant City, Florida? It could have been a month ago. That vitamin C is already oxidized off. And how many oranges are you getting in that glass of orange juice? How much fructose are you getting? And the bell started coming on. I said, have you ever been in a dark room, the light finally comes on? Well, the light come on. And uh, I said, Phil, you're exactly right. I remember I was at the nurse's station one time and this... Uh, this physician was writing an order for a patient that uh, had a UTI. And he said, I want one cup of cranberry juice cue meal. So one cup of cranberry juice every meal. Nutritionist happened to be sitting at the nursing station. She said, that ain't enough. You need to put a quart per meal. Oh, we know that's not true. Uh, she was just giving him a hard time. A quart of sugar when you got an infection? That's not. So that's why we use Demanos. Demanos is much superior. Uh, one teaspoon of D-mannose every two hours will knock out a urinary tract infection, kidney infection. Amazing. Physicians now, are, urologists are now sending their patients to us with patients with urinary tract infections, even IC, inter interstitial cystitis, to take, um, oh, I'm not drinking my water, to drink the, uh, drink, to take the, uh, the uh, D-mannose because it works so well for, it's uh, D-mannose, Demanos is the chemical that's in cranberries and blueberries that why we use cranberries. It's just, it's like, have, who's ever done bromelain? What's bromelain in? Pineapple. But you can't eat that much pineapple to get that amount of bromelain for the anti-inflammatory and whatever effect you're after. <clears throat> so you just take just the bromelain or the allicin. Like when I take allicin, uh, one, one drop has 24 cloves of garlic. Well, you couldn't, a teaspoon, that's a lot of garlic. And so, um, so you just take the allicin. Well, the same thing's true with the demanos. Demanos is the chemical in the cranberries and also blueberries. Here's how it works. Do you know how a skunk gets rid of fleas? How? That's exactly right. That's right. He'll put a stick in his mouth, some grass in his mouth, and he goes to still water and slowly backs down. And that white stripe turns black. 
as he's slowly going down, slowly going down. And finally, it's just his nose sticking out, and the grass turns black. The stick turns black. He lets go of it, swims back out, and where do you leave the fleas? Out there in the water. Well, here's how it works. Do y'all, any of y'all have cattle up here? Anybody ever lived on cows, dairy, or cattle up here? Do y'all use... Do y'all use wire or do you use twine for uh, bales of hay? Twine. twine, okay. We do too. But some places up north will use wire. wire. And so what happens is that you'll take you a, a, a magnet that's about, well, I'm trying to, somewhere a little bit, about this round, but a little bit longer. And you, and like worming, and worming, and you put that magnet into the first stomach. Cows have four stomachs. And you put that in that first stomach. And in case there's any wire that gets broken in the hay, it, it collects to that magnet. And so then when you, when you uh, go and slaughter the cow, the slaughterhouse will, if you're in that area, will cut that magnet off, clean off the wire, and resell it, uh, the magnet. Well, demanos works like that magnet or like that s- stick. The pathogen loves demanos. It's like birthday cake. And so you take it, and it, it, it just runs to it and starts eating it and clings on to it. The problem is if you, if you give the demanos every two hours, then they're going to say, hey, there's more birthday cake in two hours. But if you force fluids, you'll urinate out the demanos with the little, little guys on there, the E. coli, or, I mean, the, uh, yeah, on there, and it just take it right on out. And so that's how you get rid of the UTI. I have ladies come in, and they tell me the itching, stinging, burning is gone within 20 to th- 15 to 20 minutes. It's that effective. It's amazing. I just I never want to run out because there's so many problems. It works both for men and women. But also, if a person has IC, it works good for that. And the urologists have figured this out, and they just send them over to me to get the D-manos. Capital D dash capital M then A-N-N-O-S-E, I think. I can't spell. I took phonics in school, so I spell like a talk, so it don't work good. Uh, D-M-A-N-N-O-S, as in Sam, E. D-Manos, S-E. Uh, one teaspoon every two hours. Waking, every waking two hours. And normally, we see a significant benefit within 24, 48 hours. Uh, but again, that itchy, stinging, burning, they tell me, is gone within 15 to 20 minutes. Very, very effective. How do you spell Allison? A-L-L-I-C-I-N, I think. I think that's how to spell it. Let's see here. A-L-L-I-C-I-N. It's right here. B6, vitamin B6 is, a vital, is vital for supporting biochemical reactions in the immune system. B6 is found in green uh, vegetables, chickpeas, again, Cleveland Clinic. And B6 is also extremely important for nerve function. Um, a lot of, why are we deficient in B vitamins? Pardon? Okay. All right, what else? What's the big reason? What's the number one diagnosis in America? Stress. Pardon? Okay, that's true. That's exactly right. Some people don't methylate. You're right. Stress. Stress. Stress dumps. Again, go back to Neil Nedley. Nedley's a great guy. I like his proof positive. I like his depression on the way out. And depression on the way out, Neil talks about when you're stressed, you dump B vitamins. You dump lithium. You dump magnesium. See, what happens when adrenaline goes up in fight or flight? Adrenaline can harm the cells. And so God puts this big old fire extinguishing system, kind of like a hood system in a kitchen. And uh, when you get stressed, it pulls the switch, and you dump this chemical to buffer, to protect your cells from the harmful effects of adrenaline. And that chemical is magnesium. 
And that's one of the major reasons people are deficient in magnesium is because of stress, also because you're not getting any of your green, you're not you're eating green leafy vegetables. People say, I don't, I have people who, come, I ask, you know, what do you eat for vegetables? I just do potatoes. That's the only vegetable I eat. What do you do for fruit? I don't do fruit. Can you imagine never eating fruit? I have people come to see me that do not do any fruit. No mangoes. Can you imagine that? No grapes. No, no, no fruit. And the only vegetable is potatoes in the form of french fries. French fries. Yeah. Pota- uh, potato chips. That's right. Um, so your, um, your magnesium, a great source of magnesium is green leafy vegetables. So we're dumping magnesium because of stress. We're dumping B vitamins. We're dumping lithium. Lithium is tremendous, tremendous for helping with stress. Not your pharmaceutical lithium. Your synthetic. But lithium, aspartate, lithium, orotate. I like orotate better. But lithium orotate is phenomenal for helping with stress. Uh, because you dumped it with your last stressor. Your next stressor comes and you don't have enough. And Neil said... You know, sometimes our diets just don't have enough for the amount of stress we have, so we need to supplement. In 1978, I was, who's ever lived in Orlando? Anybody? Okay, do you remember Florida Hospital? Yes. It used to be. You did? Okay, remember the old, when, what year? Well, they were in oh, in Aldemont. Okay. What well, was that, Aldemont? An old dock at Flat, I wish, I, pardon? 85. 85, okay. There was an old dock there. I wish I remembered his name. He was retiring there, Aldemont. And, um, so I was, he said, well, if you want to help your patients with stress, the best thing I've ever found was, um, was vitamin, it was B-complex. And I found it to be very true. Yeah, that was at Orange Grove before they built the hospital there. Yeah, I watched them build the hospital. And then Altamont Mall, it was just Orange Grove. Yeah. Um, so B6 is, is important for your immune system, according to Cleveland Clinic. Uh, vitamin E, another one that stress dumps. Stress dumps vitamin E. Vitamin E is a powerful antioxidant that helps the body fight off infection. Foods rich in vitamin E include nuts, seeds, and spinach. Again, Cleveland Clinic. Elderberries, does it grow up here? Yes? Do people collect it? Do the old ladies collect it? Good. Did you know Miss White would plant it where she would grow and live? She would plant, have put elderberry plants in. Yeah, where I where I'm from, the old ladies, you know, you know the the older folks they knew what they were doing. They really did, and they would they take where I'm from in Appalachia. They'll go and, and harvest the berries, and they would freeze them, and put them in little little baggies, and then when someone got sick, they just pull it out and make a tea out of it, a tea out of it, and. Um, and it's very, very good. Um, elderberries inhibit the early stages of an infection by blocking key viral proteins responsible for both the viral attachment and entry into the host cells. Isn't that cool? That's cool. Yeah. Um, the phytochemicals from the elderberry juice were shown to be effective at stopping the virus infecting the cells. However, to the surprise of the researchers, they were even more effective at inhibiting viral propagation at later stages of the influenza cycle when the cells had already been infected with the virus. Isn't God good? Amen. That's huge. That's really important. Uh, the effects of what it does for the lungs is amazing. This observation was quite surprising and rather significant because blocking the viral cycle at several stages has a higher chance of inhibiting the viral infection. This is the University of Sydney. Astragalus. Who's ever done astragalus? Anybody done astragalus? Oh, that's, that's a daily thing. I, I mean, astragalus is good for so many things. Uh, a broad array of, uh, the broad array of immune-stimulating characteristics of astragalus has been widely used in treating patients with both acute and chronic infections, including viral mitocarditis and viral hepatitis. Astragalus has demonstrated immune potentiating effects in humans, animals, and in in vitro, and, and in vitro studies, uh, and is often used as an adjunct therapy in HIV positive persons and those with AIDS. Wow, I missed the... Uh, who that source was, I apologize. Uh, echinacea. Anybody ever use echinacea? 
Yeah, echinacea. Um, echinacea pr uh, preparations are commonly given in Europe for the uh, prophylaxis and the uh, treatment of uh, uh, bacterial and viral uh, inf uh, infections and as an adjunct to treatment of more severe infections. Anybody f from Europe? Where are y'all from? Germany. Germany. I've got a buddy of mine. He's German. Um, and Dr. Stutz, is that how you pronounce Okay, thank you. <laughs> and um, he's, a, he's a physician, and he's big into um, natural stuff. Mary Lou had breast cancer 11, 12 years, no, 12, 13 years ago. And I mean, we hit it with everything, and it'd go away to just barely could they see it, and it'd come back. It'd go away, and it'd come back. And finally, it'd come back almost the size of an egg that you could palpate. And I, Sam was in the store. I said, Stan, Sam, help me. What can I do? I mean, kids were still home, and I didn't want to lose my wife. I didn't, you know, you know, and kids didn't want to lose their mama. And I said, Sam, what do I need to do? And he goes, sting her. Sting her. I said, okay, tell me what to do. He said, okay. Go distal, away from, one inch, three to five times, sting every day for 14 days. Leave stinger in for 30 minutes, pull it out, put bee propolis. How many times did he say? Three to five. So I did five. I wanted to make sure it worked. So I had bees at the time, so I went out every morning to the bees. Fortunately, it wasn't wintertime, because as y'all who have bees know, you don't want to open up the hive in the wintertime. In this kind of weather, fortunately, it was it was in uh, season when the bees were out harvesting, and so I went out to the beehive every morning, and I put them. Have you all seen them? Them uh, tweezers, plastic tweezers you get with dates, and you know in your box of dates. So I just took one. I got one of them from work, and I went out there each morning. I'd pick me up a bee, and from the front as it come in, I'd sting her. She'd cry. I'd wait about a minute. Pick up another one, sting her again, and I went around five different times for 14 days. And you can see that little little pouch on the back pumping as it's pumping more and more of that little venom in her. And left it in for 30 minutes, pulled the stinger out, then I put B-propolis on it. It shrank down, plum went away. Isn't that cool? Because of a German physician that believed in natural. Yeah. Uh, I had some, uh, who knows... Um, Dr. Gabriella and Leslie Tolan. Anybody know them? Romanians. And Dr. Tolan told me, he said, we learned this stuff in medical school in Romania. Because, now Tolan is probably in his late 70s. So that tells you when he went to medical school and the issues with USSR and that kind of stuff and the financial viability of Romania at the time. He said... We did not have access to pharmaceuticals like you have in America. They taught us plant phytochemicals in medical school. We, yes, we learned pharmacology, but we learned the plant pharmacology. Isn't that cool? So cool. Um, so this is Europe using the echinacea. Echinacea extracts are commonly used to treat upper respiratory infections, influenza-like infections, and are, uh, I'm sorry, influenza-like infections, and are reported to significantly reduce the symptoms accompanying the common cold. Well, it does more than just the common cold. Uh, iodine. Did you know iodine tune for the immune system? Yeah, we heard that during the COVID uh, issue. Iodine, natural antiviral. It's, natural, it's a natural antiviral, antifungal, and antibiotic. Iodine was the most effective agent for killing viruses, especially influenza viruses. Aerosol iodine was found to kill various uh, viruses that spray and sprayed mist, and solutions of iodine were equally effective. Who's ever heard of Dr. George Fletches? Dr. George Fletches. Fletches internal medicine. Um, Fletches actually found some really cool stuff with, with, with iodine. But... Um, People would give him a hard time because with cancer patients, he was given 100 milligrams a day of uh, the Lugol solution, which is potassium iodide and potassium iodine. 
And these physicians buddies would go, you know, and say, you know, George, this is crazy. Why are you giving 100 milligrams? He says, don't you remember back years ago in the 60s when we were given 400 milligrams? Oh, yeah, we weren't working. Any, did we have any negative outcomes? No, we didn't. So George has found that using iodine significantly increases the immune system, but it's also very, very effective in hypothyroidism. But this is really cool. He noticed that his female patients were increasing with breast cancer. Why? Why was he getting more and more female press patients with breast cancer? So he started looking around the world. Where else in the world is there not breast cancer? And he found Japan doesn't have a lot of breast cancer. Well, what's the difference? What's, is there anything that could be correlated here? Well, in Japan, the average female consumes 13.7 milligrams of iodine a day. In America at the time, American women were consuming 0 0.125 milligrams of iodine a day. Now, see, we've moved away from Morton's, haven't we? Yeah, iodine salt. So now we're using sea salt, or better yet, we're using Himalayan salt, and there's no iodine usually in that. So George Fletcher started giving his female patients 12.5 milligrams of iodine a day. Over the years, he found that the women with breast cancer started diminishing, diminishing, diminishing. He's then hooked up with another physician, and they found it was significant in preventing breast cancer. But this is, that's cool. That's cool. But this is really cool. And now Germany is doing research on this. Where, what Fletcher was doing, he was giving girls, um, say y'all's age, he was giving them, uh, all of his female patients, iodine. Now, breast cancer, is it only in 45 and over? Can we have teenagers getting breast cancer? Absolutely we can. So he was giving his, his, his upper teenage girls in, in his practice, patients, iodine. He noticed that the kids were smart, these, you know, their kids, as they would then have children. And then he gets approached by the school superintendent. And he said, Dr. Fletcher, what are you doing to your kids? What are you talking about? Now, this is in a little community in North Carolina, uh, in, near, in, um, outside of Asheville, North Carolina, Hendersonville, Henderson County. And the superintendent says, I have eight children in the school system that are menses. He says, we just don't get menses in this county. And the only correlation of those eight kids is you are their family doctor. The, fa the kids in their different schools. The parents, none of the parents know each other. The only correlation is you or the family doctor. What are you doing? He says, I'll tell you what I'm doing. He says, you know, keep doing it. But he says, tell me what you're doing. He says, I'm giving 12.5 milligrams of iodine to these kids, to the, to the women. And during that pregnancy, it's improving it, the, the kid's IQ. He said, keep doing it. Just let us know when you see a bright kid come through. So what Fletcher did is he started doing 12.5 milligrams of iodine during the pregnancy, especially in the first two trimesters, trimesters just like you would folic, any need for folic acid. So 12.5 milligrams. Oh, what it did, on average, the IQ is increased 10 to 12 points above the mother's IQ. Now that is cool. That is cool. So where I go to, to, to Africa... And the ambassador that I stay with there, he just wrote a book on, or was writing a book on brain function, how to improve children's brain function. He stopped the press and said, I need this information, and put the information in his book. His daughter is the secretary to the president of the country. We'll probably see something coming out of that. So here's what he did. 12.5 milligrams of iodine through the pregnancy. When the, mother, when the baby's born, go to 25 milligrams. And until the child is uh, two years of age, nursing. And then once the child can chew the iodine, do 3.125 milligrams of iodine. And that's the results. Well, Germany gets, he, here's this information. So now Germany's doing research, but during pregnancy, instead of 12.5, they're doing 25 milligrams during pregnancy and 50 milligrams during, during uh, breastfeeding and having higher results in 10 to 12 points, 10 to 15 points above their mother's IQ. To me, that's just, why not? It's a legal solution. And why not improve our children's IQ? Do you think that will better prepare them for discernment? Absolutely it will. Okay. Iodine's good.
but you want it's a potassium iodide and potassium iodine. It's legal. Now you can do liquid or you can do pill. Liquid, you, it, the effect is about an hour and a half, where with the pill, you can have a, a time release and you've got about 12 and a half hours. NAC, um, y'all know about the NAC. Let me just, I'm running out of time, y'all. Um, NAC has good benefits there. Um, rocket fuel, who's done rocket fuel? All right. So I'll do uh, five to 10 cloves of garlic, Half of an onion, thumb of ginger, juice of two lemons, two tablespoons of honey, cayenne pepper, an eighth to a half a teaspoon. Be careful with your cayenne. Cayenne has a huge disparity in heating units. You can have 20,000 or you can have, there's a new one that's just come out from China. It's three point something million. The, the Carolina Reaper is uh, 2.1 million. So be careful which cayenne pepper you use when you're doing this. Elderberry syrup. Now, that's the left is the norm. I added elderberry syrup, one tablespoon, alley med, which is the garlic, one tablespoon, and then add warm water to net a quart, blend, drink all within 30, 60 minutes. So the left is the original. I've added the other two out there. It's more palatable, and it's even stronger. Okay, so those are things to take. So as we look at the immune system, you can do every one of these things. Yes? Uh, just a quick question. On NAC, what is your recommended dosage? 600 is what we see out there. But I was reading some research the other day, and what they're looking at is 1,500 for the first week and 1,000 thereafter during the uh, infection. It is. The 600, 600 today is normal. Yes, yes. Be careful with zinc, though. There's a female physician in Sevier County. She was giving her staff and her patients 230-some a day by itself. When you get to 50, you want to supplement with copper because zinc dumps copper. If you get a patient that has high copper levels, how do, you get rid, how do you lower the copper? You give them zinc. So if you're taking 50 milligrams of zinc, which is fine, you need to take about three to five milligrams of copper to, because you're dumping copper with the zinc. Just like, let's say, and this, I see this so, so often. Person comes in who has, uh, say, osteoporosis and the physician's giving them 1,000, 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day but no magnesium. When you take calcium, it takes magnesium to break it down. You need half the amount of magnesium as you do calcium. So if you're doing 1,200 milligrams of calcium, you need to be 600 milligrams of magnesium. And that's not helping you with the rest of your magnesium needs for the day. That's just dealing with the calcium you just took because you, because you, dump, you, you, you use up magnesium to break down the, the calcium. So anyway, so if you do... Zinc, be sure to take copper with it. Okay. Sure. Can you tell me the difference between the Alley Med and the Allison? I can. Alley Med is, Alice, is stabilized Allison. So you can take Allison. Uh, there's different Allisons out there. Alley Med is just a, a higher quality of Allison that's stabilized better. It's the best stabilized Allison I have found. So which one can you nebulize? One liquid? Or it's the, it's the liquid. It'd be like the alley med. It's what you're going to nebulize. Okay, thank yeah. You. Also, you can nebulize, um, let's say, you're, and I learned this from Dr. Arcella, the surgeon, and also from Dr. Agatha. Um, if you, let's say you've got lung issues and you need, a uh, person's taking albuterol, well, you can nebulize uh, eucalyptus oil, essential oil, and it works better than albuterol, and you don't have the side effects. So you just take your nebulized container, put, say, um, distilled water or normal saline, put you around four drops of a good quality eucalyptus oil and nebulize that PRN as you would albuterol and it works better as a bronchial dilator. Mullen is also a bronchial dilator. That's why we're seeing so much mullen being used now for, for lung issues, for coronavirus. It's also the best herb for the lungs. Yes? Uh, 
That's a good question. Um, cayenne pepper is like a catalyst. Remember catalysts in chemistry? It makes, take two, it makes two things work better. So cayenne actually makes everything work better. You're okay if you, if you didn't have the cayenne. Yes. Yeah, nightshades. Also be careful with lobelia. Lobelia, if you ever use lobelia, it's also a nightshade. Lobelia is a tremendous herb that's an antispasmatic, antispasmodic, but it's also a spasmodic. If you take too much, it works just like Ipecac. But uh, it's, uh, it's great for the lung function and, and, and a number of things. But if you're, if you're having that good success with, with your nightshades, don't do lobelia. So we can do all of this. We can do all of these guys. But if you do the cause, the sugar, the stress, the uh, sleep deprivation, especially those three, you wipe this out right here. And so it's kind of like sin, you know. We can do all the right stuff, but what happens if we just do this one over here? How many does it take? True? One carrot. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we strive for perfection. Is that okay to strive for perfection? Yes. It is okay. But we're supposed to step away from. And yes, we have sometimes we fall. Look at David. Look at Paul. You know, look at these guys out there. So, yes, there's going to be challenges. But that cherished sin, as you say? Yeah. Any questions? Yes. Don't we all feel equal on a daily basis? I have a sister son and a pastor. So. You know, that's a good question. Uh, I, because of Dr. Fletcher's recommendation that, to go to the pill form, I've just done the 12.5 milligrams, uh, which is like a uh, ithroid, uh, iodorol, uh, uh, there's another one, um, Lugotab. And because it's time-released, you just get a better results than you do the, just taking the liquid. Yeah. So if I were to use the liquid... I don't, I don't know. No, because when I started using iodine, it was me going and learning from Fletch's, and he told me not to use it because it just wasn't as good. Now, does it mean it doesn't work? It works, just not as good, and I was going after optimum. So I, so I just don't have the experience. Any other questions? All right, tomorrow morning we're going to talk about stress, how to address stress naturally. We're going to talk about how to build the brain. Is it important for the brain to work? Amen. It's called preparing the battle, preparing the brain for battle. Are we in a battle? Is, there, is it going to get worse? It's going to be a time as never before, and we're going to talk about that during the divine service time. In the afternoon, we're going to talk about <clears throat> benefits of essential oils, which essential oils are what? Herbs that are just like herbs on steroids. Did you know that one drop of peppermint essential oil, you'd have to drink 28 cups of peppermint tea to get the same medicinal benefit? One drop of peppermint essential oil gives you the same medicinal benefit as 28 cups of peppermint tea. It's kind of like the Allison. You know, 24 cloves equals one drop. So we're able to get more in without. And plus, it, when you go on a trip, it's easier to carry that essential oil with you than to t bring all your leaves and have to you know, make your teas where you are. And then um, Sunday, we're going to do, um, do hydrotherapy, which is just a lot of fun. So, okay. Well, let's close with prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, again, your love, your care, your patience for us. Give us a hankering. Give us a desire to learn about these simple remedies that you've given us. That we can have strong body, strong mind, strong immune system so that we can serve you more. Because when we're sick, we, can't, we don't think it's good. We can't work as good for you. And so, Lord, Lord, give us a desire to take care of our bodies. It's not ours. You said it. We're just taking care of it. It's yours. Uh, it belongs to you. We're told that in Corinthians because of your son's death. 
uh, he bought it back. Lord, give us that understanding and give us that desire to do the best that we can. Uh, and we ask then that you bless. Give us safety as we travel home. Send your angels before us and bring us back tomorrow. And thank you for Sabbath that we can just plumb stop and spend time with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.